Hello, my name is Ordi Ortwine. I volunteer for the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum, and I will speak more about that organization at the end. Right now, we're here to talk about Ray Bradbury's career in Hollywood. And I wanted to do this talk to kind of put to rest a myth. Some people think that as the author of Fahrenheit 451, this dystopia where firemen burn books that somehow Bradbury was anti-TV and anti-movies. And when the Michael B. Jordan version of Fahrenheit 451 on HBO came out a couple of years ago, some people thought, well, isn't that ironic? But it's not ironic at all. Bradbury loved movies and had a lifelong career in Hollywood. So, but to start out, now he was something of a technophobe. He never learned to drive. He didn't born a plane until he was 62. He briefly owned a computer, but never used one. And quite ironically, he didn't even own a TV when some of his first works were adapted for television. But he absolutely loved movies. That's Lon Chaney there's Phantom of the Opera. So as a boy, he saw as many films as he could. And just to give you some examples of his obsession with movies. So he once spent all day at the movies just so he could repeatedly see the Disney five-minute short Skeleton Dance. That was one of Disney's earlier efforts. And he was only eight years old, and his dad finally had to drag him out of the theater. And his mother named him after Douglas Fairbanks. That's Bradbury's middle name, Douglas. And then... Briefly, the Bradbury family lived in Tucson, Arizona, where 12-year-old Ray got a job working for a radio station. Among other things, they let him read the Sunday funnies over the radio, and they paid him with movie tickets. And then, as a newsboy, he often traded unsold papers for free tickets. Now, I don't know this for sure, but my understanding was that back then, these newspaper boys, these newsies, paid for the papers up front and sold at a markup. So basically he would steal from himself just to get movie tickets. So the Bradbury's moved to LA when he was just shy of 14. And this is a quote from an essay he wrote called LA, How Do I Love Thee? It says, let me go back to 1934. Hand me my roller skates. With them, I skated through life in Los Angeles when I was 14 and he did. So as a 14-year-old, he skated all over L.A., getting audiographs from W.C. Fields, Laurel and Hardy, Al Jolson, many others. He even managed to get himself photographed with people like Marlena Dietrich and George Burns. And he struck up something of a friendship with George Burns. He actually sent him scripts, and he even used, Burns did, one of Bradbury's jokes on the radio. And George Burns and his wife, Gracie Allen, they had a show back then that had millions of listeners. So... Basically, Bradbury was buddies with his generation's equivalent of, say, Stephen Colbert. It really is quite amazing that an unknown like him could just sort of pal around with George Burns. And once, Bradbury and a buddy of his snuck into Paramount by climbing over a back wall. They were quickly escorted out, but Bradbury would return. So these are some quotes that Bradbury has in writing for Hollywood. So most people haven't discovered this, and that includes Hollywood, that the secret is the screenplays. He really felt that writers are the overlooked heroes of Hollywood. If you look at the average page of any of my novels or short stories, it's a shooting script. You can shoot the paragraphs, the close-ups, the long shots, what have you. He very much thought of himself as being influenced by all of the pop culture technology of the early 20th century, the movies, radio, comics, all of that. So he's very much a person of his time. And then I love this last one. No one ever remembered screenwriters. How many can you name? <laughs> it's pretty good. Some of his earliest adaptations were for the radio, which was another love of his. Remember, as a boy in Tucson, Arizona, he worked for a radio station, and he really loved a lot of those old radio shows. And some of his stories adapted were adapted by Lights Out, Dimension X, and X-Minus One. Those are some of the best radio shows of its time. 
and he adapted a lot of his best-known stories, such as The Veld, Mars is Heaven, and Zero Hour. And Stephen King later said that the X, I'm sorry, the Dimension X production of Mars in Heaven was his introduction to horror. So Radbury definitely had an influence. So after the Illustrated and the Martian Chronicles, he's something of a rising star, and there were a lot of offers for TV adaptations. So the first one was on NBC, and unfortunately I haven't seen this yet, but there were there was the TV version of Lights Out that filmed Zero Hour. The CBS also recorded Great Wide World, and then several of his stories and teleplays were adapted for television. So both NBC and CBS talked about adapting Fahrenheit 451, but neither one did officially. CBS kind of did, and we'll talk more about that later. So, its earliest film is something called It Came From Outer Space. So in 52, Universal Pictures wants Bradbury to write a monster movie. Now remember, Universal back then, that's what they're known for, right? Frankenstein, Dracula, the Wolfman, and so on. So they want him to write a monster movie. And it, it looks on the surface like just another 50s sci-fi aliens invading Earth kind of thriller. So he worked under the titles The Meteor and Atomic Monster. But while it looks like just another 50s space flick, Bradbury bucks the trend. He goes against type. So what makes it unique is that it came from outer space really humanizes the aliens. We literally see things from the alien point of view. Uh, whenever we're supposed to be seeing things through alien eyes or eye, actually, I don't know what they did, but they clearly put some kind of filter over the camera so you can see what they're seeing. It's very much an empathetic film from, for the aliens. And it reminds me a lot of the Martian Chronicles in the sense that, you know, yes, the aliens do bad things, but only because they feel that they need to. And really, it's the Earthlings who are the bad guys. So he kind of turns this trope of aliens invading Earth really on its head. And also, as in the Martian Chronicles, the aliens have the ability to mimic humans. Kind of taps into 50s Cold War propaganda, uh, Cold War paranoia that way. So his next picture, sort of, he gets to work with his good buddy, Ray Harryhausen. So Harryhausen, if you don't know, was a stop-motion effects genius. He worked on probably his best-known film as Jason and the Argonauts with its famous skeleton fighting scene. He was the master of stop-motion animation. Clash of the Titans was his last film. And the two Rays, Harryhausen and Bradbury, have been friends since they were both 18. And as kids, you know, they used to go to bookstores and get dinosaur books together and just talk about dinosaurs endlessly. And they said that someday they would make a great dinosaur movie together. Well, this is it. This is as close as they got. So... The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms is loosely based on a story of Bradbury's called The Foghorn. So Bradbury sells this story to the Saturday Evening Post, who, for whatever reason, changed it to The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. So the story goes that Hal Chester, their producer, asked Bradbury to look at the rough outline for a film they were calling Monster from the Sea. And Bradbury reads it, and he feels that this is an accidental swipe of the foghorn. He was especially caught by the fact that in both the movie and in his story, a sea monster attacks a lighthouse. So Chester apologized and wrote him a check to purchase the rights to the story. And what happened next is in some dispute. So Bradbury said that he wanted to work on the film, but they never called him back. Harryhausen always said Ray never called them back. Who knows, really? Ray's name does appear in the credits and on the poster, simply Story by Ray Bradbury. So that is the closest that the two Rays ever came to professionally working together. Now, his next break in pictures comes from a couple of, you know, powerhouses. So Moby Dick, obviously, the great American novel, so Bradbury had always wanted to work with John Huston, and he was a total rock star back then. So in 52, Bradbury met with director John Huston, gave him copies of his books, and said, I love your films, I love you, and if you love these books half as much as my affection for you, I want you to hire me someday. So they corresponded for two years, 
before Houston asked him to write the screenplay for Moby Dick. The story goes that Bradbury just came home from hanging out with his good buddy Ray Harryhausen, and his wife had a message for him that John Houston had called. So they agree to meet in a hotel the next day, and that's where Houston asks him if he would be interested in working on Moby Dick. And Bradbury was always just honest about everything. He said, you know, I've never been able to finish that book. I don't know if I can do this, but I'll tell you what I'll do, John Houston. I'll get a copy of the book, I'll read it, and I'll tell you the next day if I think I can do this. So he goes to a bookstore to buy a copy of Moby Dick, and he told somebody there about the predicament he was in, and a woman comes up to him and says, I overheard what you said. Do not take this assignment. John Houston will destroy you. She used the word destroy, and it turned out she was an ex-wife of a screenwriter who had worked for John Houston. And John Houston did indeed have a well-earned reputation as being a cruel joker, and nowadays maybe they would call it gaslighting or bullying. He was just generally known as a mean guy. But nevertheless, Bradbury accepted the assignment. This was just too good of an opportunity to pass up. So things did not always go well. So Houston rented an estate outside of Dublin, complete with servants and everything, and insisted Bradbury work on the project in Ireland. So the Bradbury stayed at a hotel in Dublin. Now, most of the film was shot in the Canary Islands. So why all this work in Ireland? Well, it turned out Houston, he was a big sportsman. He loved fox hunting. Ireland apparently had great fox hunting at that time, and he didn't want to miss the fox hunting season. So Bradbury and his wife and his then two little girls all have to move to Ireland so John Houston can go fox hunting. And this gives you an idea of the kind of relationship they had. Bradbury had a very strained relationship with Houston. Houston is one of the few people Bradbury ever said a few to. Uh, Bradbury was not a big fan of profanity, so it says something. Houston apparently brought up the best in him. And on another occasion, Houston even threatened to punch Bradbury in the face, and Bradbury replied, go ahead and hit me, but then fire me. So yeah, things didn't always work out, but ultimately Bradbury said, this man changed my life completely and forever, only for the good. He really did feel that Houston had opened up a lot of doors to him. And he would later document his experiences in Ireland, first in a variety of short stories, and then eventually he would combine these stories into the novel Green Shadows, White Whale. It's very much an autobiographical novel of his time in Ireland. And the film was very successful. It starred Gregory Peck. It was a big hit. And also, he would go on to write something called Leviathan 99. And this was basically a sci-fi version of Moby Dick, only they're hunting a great white comet. And instead of losing a leg, the captain loses his eyesight. And this screenplay that he wrote would be recorded as a radio broadcast by the BBC. You can find it online. I totally recommend it. It's a lot of fun to listen to. And Bradbury also published this as a short novel in 2007. So after Moby Dick, he was offered many screenplay offers and he turned down all of them. He really felt he should stick to writing uh, fiction, but he does continue to work in television. So he had something of a rivalry with Rod Serling. So Bradbury always claimed that he helped Rod Serling launch the Twilight Zone. What he said was that Serling came to him and said, you know, I just agreed to do this fantasy series, but I feel like I'm out of my element. So Bradbury gave him several fantasy sci-fi books, including his own books, and said that this could maybe help give him ideas and inspire him. And Bradbury later felt that Rod had unintentionally borrowed quite a bit from himself and from others. So Bradbury really felt that the pilot episode was very similar to his Silent Towns, because both involve a man completely alone in an empty city. And he also thought that Nothing in the Dark looked suspiciously like his own story, Death and the Maiden. So he generally believed that Rod had, however, unintentionally borrowed ideas of his. And he even claims that Rod admitted as much in a private phone conversation. 
Now, some people think that Rod was really just kind of going along with Bradbury because he wanted Bradbury to continue to work on the show, which he did. So, and in some ways, Rod does give Bradbury credit. On one episode, there's a character named Dr. Bradbury, and on another, there's something called the Bradbury Account. I doubt that's a coincidence. Rod is probably at least acknowledging Bradbury in some way. So Bradbury wrote three scripts for The Twilight Zone, but only one called I Sing the Body Electric was produced. Uh, that's an episode basically about a robot grandmother. And Bradbury was not happy with the result. He felt Serling had cut too much of his script and was not pleased with the result. And what Serling said about Bradbury, I think is very true. It helps explain why Bradbury has not always translated to the big screen very well. He said, Ray Bradbury is a very difficult guy to dramatize because that which reads so beautifully on the printed page doesn't fit in the mouth, it fits in the head. I think that's very true. Bradbury is very descriptive, very fascinating to read, but sometimes it can be hard to translate that to the screen. So decades later, I Sing the Body Electric was turned into a TV movie called The Electric Grandmother, which Bradbury thought much more highly of. But at both the first and last Comic-Con, Bradbury claimed that Rod had essentially stolen ideas from him and others, so they never totally patched up their rivalry. So someone else that Bradbury really liked working with was Alfred Hitchcock. So Bradbury wrote seven episodes of Alfred Hitchcock Presents, mostly based on short stories of his. He said that they were similar spirits. And ironically, Hitchcock offered Bradbury to work on The Birds, but Bradbury was already bound to write for Alfred Hitchcock Presents, so unfortunately that project never involved him. Now here we get something kind of interesting. So as you've seen, throughout his career, Bradbury would frequently accuse others of basically stealing his ideas, but the only time he ever did anything about it legally was something involving a TV show called Playhouse 90. This is a show on CBS. So it was the only time Bradbury legally sued for plagiarism. So he claimed that one of their episodes, A Sound of Different Drummers, was an unauthorized adaptation of Fahrenheit 451. And I'll be honest here, I have not seen this, so I really can't comment on that, but apparently there are these bookmen who destroy books. Now, Bradbury did win, but it was long and costly. It almost went to the Supreme Court. And he would later say that it was not worth it. And he claimed that there were others he could have sued over the years, but this experience taught him that it just wasn't worth it. So that was the only time Bradbury would ever take legal action regarding plagiarism. Not long after, Bradbury dips his toe into the world of animation. There was an animated short made based on his story of the same name, and the name of the story is, and literally pardon my French, because it's not a language I speak, Icarus Montgolfier Wright. This is about an astronaut dreaming about the history of air travel before he embarks on Earth's first voyage to the moon. This animated short came out in 1962. And the names all refer to different pioneers of air travel. Icarus is the mythological figure who flew too close to the sun. Montgolfier, those are the French brothers who invented the hot air balloon. And Wright, those are, of course, the Wright brothers, inventors of the airplane. So this short predicts our first trip to the moon is happening on August 23rd, 1970. He wasn't too far off. And our first trip to Mars was to be in the summer of 1999. His good friend and illustrator, Joe Mugnani, spent a year animating this 20-minute film by creating hundreds of watercolors. You can see this film on YouTube and elsewhere. It really is worth watching. It's a lot of fun. Just a very beautiful piece of work. In fact, it was nominated for Best Animated Short, but unfortunately, it didn't win. So in the 60s, some other works of his were adapted. So The Illustrated Man, maybe his best-known book after Fahrenheit or The Martian Chronicles, was adapted for the big screen in 69. And his good friend, Rod Steiger, spent as much as 10 hours a day getting the tattoos painted on. 
So it adapted three stories from the Illustrated Man, The Velt, The Long Rain, and The Last Night of the World. And Bradbury was not directly involved with the making of the picture. And he would later say, it's no good, it's boring. Like I said, he was always pretty honest. And the story goes that after a screening, a teenage boy spotted Bradbury and said, Mr. Bradbury, what happened? So he was not a big fan of the film. I don't think it's too bad. I don't think it lives down to its reputation. But in any case, Bradbury was not a big fan of it. And sort of an interesting aside, that same year, there was another film based on a story of his called Picasso Summer. But this one was so bad that it never even made it to the big screen. So 69, maybe not a good year for Mr. Bradbury. Next, we come to an adaptation that Bradbury liked quite a bit, and that is Fahrenheit 451. It was adapted by the French filmmaker Francois Truffaut, and Bradbury felt that it was very good. He especially liked the score composed by Bernard Herrmann, who Bradbury had personally recommended. This is not to say Bradbury didn't have some complaints. He was disappointed there was no mechanical hound. He also felt that casting the same woman, Julie Christie, to play both Montag's wife and Clarice was a mistake. And Bradbury especially didn't care for the implied sexual tension between Clarice and Montag. He said that that was never what he intended. And there's all kinds of interesting backstory about this film. So apparently Paul Newman was going to play Montag, but he backed out. Instead, he was played by Oscar Werner. And Oscar Werner and Truffaut did not get along. At one point, Werner felt his physical safety was at risk. Remember, this is all practical effects. Those are real fires in the film. Those are real flamethrowers. In any case, Werner and Truffaut did not get along. But interestingly, this was Truffaut's first and only film in English, a language that he actually did not speak. Luckily, plenty of people involved with the show did. And it was also Truffaut's first film in color. Did not necessarily get good critical reviews, but it was one of Bradbury's favorites. Another well-known project of his was Something Wicked This Way Comes, and I had a hard time trying to figure out where to put it in the chrono chronology because it goes back decades. So this originated from a short story of Bradbury's called The Black Ferris, and he was good friends with Gene Kelly. Well, not friends necessarily, but they knew each other, they respected each other, and Gene Kelly always said that he would try to get something of Bradbury's made. So Bradbury typed up the script for Something Wicked This Way Comes, and Gene Kelly shopped it around, but he couldn't find any financial backing. So the script changed hands many times before Disney did the adaptation in 1982. And he hired director, so they hired director Jack Clayton, who hired John Mortimer to rewrite Bradbury's script. And this really irked Bradbury. He felt the script was fine the way it was. He said all you had to do was basically stuff the pages into the camera. And he was very disappointed in how it was filmed and he demanded much of it be reshot. And he claimed that they would later spend about $5 million reshooting the film and that he was an unofficial director. So he was not pleased with the result. Personally, I don't think it's too bad. I think it's worth watching, but Bradbury really didn't care for it. I think the ending was maybe the biggest difference. The ending of the movie is a much more over-the-top, big sci-fi ending. It's Disney, you know, and this was the era of Star Wars when after Star Wars, suddenly everybody wanted a big budget sci-fi epic of their own. So maybe that played into some of the decision making there. But personally, I highly recommend it. There's also the Martian Chronicles. So this, again, was often bandied about. John Huston said he'd be interested in making this. So, But it did not get made until the 80s. So in 1982, they filmed it in 1980 was released in 82 as a three-part miniseries starring Rock Hudson, Darren McGavin, Roddy McDowell, among others. And interestingly, Richard Matheson, also himself a well-known science fiction writer, wrote the script. So Bradbury had no direct influence on the series. And as for his opinion of the series, at a press conference, he said it was boring. <laughs> he was always brutally honest. He did not care for this one either. You know, personally, I think it's worth watching simply because it does stick pretty closely to the source material. Now, it's very dated. There's some out-of-place disco music in there. But all told, I mean, if you don't have time to read the book, you can watch this. So, 
But he, Bradbury did not care for it. He told friends that his idea of hell was being forced to sit through the Martian Chronicles. So there you go. Now we come to one of the more interesting projects of his, the Ray Bradbury Theater. In the 70s and 80s, Bradbury is an absolute living legend in the world of sci-fi, and numerous TV networks approached him about doing a series, but he turned them all down. He felt that they would sex up his productions, add more violence, and he just wanted none of that. He agrees to do a series only if he has complete creative control. And that was granted. HBO produced the first six episodes of the Ray Bradbury Theater before giving the series over to the USA Network, where it ran from 1985 to 1992. 65 episodes were filmed, each one based on one of his stories. And that, I think, is what makes the show really unique. I really can't think of another series where every single episode was based on a story by just one guy. And a lot of 80s stars were on this show. Drew Barrymore, very young, not long after she did E.T. Jeff Goldblum was on it, maybe inevitably William Shatner. So a lot of famous people were on this show. And the series included his best known stories, such as A Sound of Thunder, Zero Hour, and The Lake. And I would say if you want to get to know Ray Bradbury, but you don't have time to read, the Ray Bradbury Theater is an excellent way to do that. It really does pretty much have all of his greatest hits here. And what's interesting about it further is that the Ray Bradbury Theater was not just his own version of The Twilight Zone. These are not just fantasy and horror stories recorded, but some of his more gentle tales. So for example, The Great Wide World over there is simply a story about an elderly woman visited by her nephew. And the Anthem Sprinters is a really funny story. It's set in Ireland. It was based on Bradbury's time in Ireland. And it's about how at the end of every movie, men would deliberately run out of the theater to avoid having to listen to the national anthem. In other words, Bradbury is filming the stories that he wants to be filmed, not just his sci-fi and horror stuff and it's evidence that he really did have complete creative control. And some fun fact here, so that building on the left there, that is actually called the Bradbury Building, and it appears in the opening credits of the Ray Bradbury Theater. Absolutely no relation, just a bizarre coincidence. Even stranger is that the Bradbury Building was designed by the grandfather of Bradbury's good friend, Forey Ackerman, Small World. The Ray Bradbury Theater won a total of 15 Cable Ace Awards. Now we come to a really overlooked project, and that is the Halloween Tree, an animated special of Bradbury's. The origins are the Charlie Brown Halloween special. It's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown. Bradbury watched this and he was really disappointed that he never saw the Great Pumpkin. Quote, it's like shooting Santa Claus as he comes down the chimney. And Bradbury's daughters were apparently so outraged that they kicked the TV. Now, I would argue that the whole point of the show is that you never see the Great Pumpkin. I mean, that is the world of Charlie Brown, right? Charlie Brown never wins a baseball game either, but I digress. And also, Bradbury had done a painting of a tree in October that he dubbed the Halloween Tree. It's a really cool painting of a tree in full autumn bloom. He was also good friends with Chuck Jones of Looney Tunes fame, who proposed they do a Halloween special of their own. And Halloween, by far Bradbury's favorite holiday, he eagerly agrees. Bradbury would create his own version of the Great Pumpkin in the character of Carapace Clavicle Mountroud. He begins by researching the history of Halloween across cultures and soon typed up a screenplay. Chuck Jones happily endorsed it, but they had difficulty finding money to produce the project. The Halloween Tree was published as a novel in 1972, basically a YA novel, and it was finally turned into an animated special in 1992 with Leonard Nimoy voicing Mr. Mountroud. And Nimoy is awesome. It is not his usual bass voice. And Mr. Mountroud is this very mysterious character who 
takes a group of boys on a tour across time and space to tell them about the history of Halloween and how other cultures celebrated the dead. And it was narrated by Ray Bradbury himself. The Halloween Tree was produced by Hanna-Barbera, and it would win an Emmy for Best Animated Children's Program. And I highly recommend this show. If you want to watch something with kids and don't want to watch the Charlie Brown Halloween special again, The Halloween Tree, it's very beautifully animated, it's educational, it's just a lot of fun all around. When asked about his favorite adaptation, Bradbury would always name the wonderful ice cream suit. And that's an interesting choice because it is not sci-fi or fantasy. It is a really funny story about five Mexican men who pool their money to buy a beautiful suit that they then share. The lead character was played by none other than, than Joe Montania, who was a lifelong Bradbury fan and said that his relationship to Bradbury will stand as one of the most shining aspects of his career. And Bradbury liked it simply because, quote, the director followed my script. It's that simple. And he was an absolute fan of it. His only disappointment was that it was not given a major theatrical release, it was produced by Disney, went directly to the Disney Channel into video, but was never played in theaters. So that was his only disappointment in the project. And his contributions did not go overlooked. There is now something called the Ray Bradbury Award. And that is the Ray Bradbury Nebula Award for Outstanding Dramatic Presentation. And it's awarded every year to screenplay writers in the field of science fiction and or fantasy. Winners have included Neil Gaiman and Jordan Peele. Jordan Peele won for Get Out. And it's kind of a fun looking trophy. The head, as it were, is based on the ball from the IBM Selectric typewriter, which was Bradbury's favorite. Now I would like to take this opportunity to speak about an organization I represent called the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum. So we are not open yet per se. We were going to do a soft opening on August 22nd. That would have been his 100th birthday. But because of the strange new world we live in, we have had to adjust that somewhat. But if you go to our website or check us out on Facebook, you can see our progress. I definitely recommend checking that out. Waukegan, Illinois is his hometown. It's just a 45 minute train ride north of Chicago. Also, we will be doing a fundraiser in his honor, and that is going to be Waukegan's first comic book convention. We're calling it Wakakan. And that, again, was going to be on his birthday, but it has been pushed back to October 17th. So if you happen to be in the Chicago area that day, just come on by. It will be in the basement of a place called, wait for it, the Greentown Tavern. Greentown is what Bradbury always called Waukegan in all of his fiction. So definitely give us a visit. And that is all I have to say. I hope you enjoyed this presentation.